Live from the Washington, D.C. area, it's the Inside Scoop, all the news that our viewers want to know. Now, here's the host. I'm Kimberly Costabile, and welcome to Inside Scoop. Tonight, we're talking about ways that creative... My name is Marisa Grady. Youth projects, creative ways to learn history. And with me, I have Lewis Carter here of the 54th Regiment reenactment. And I have Sinise Noble, who was a film was featured at the American History Film Project recently. So, uh, Sinise, you just had, you just went through the Annandale High School prom last yes, weekend. Yes, I did. It's a lot of fun. And before that, you were featured in the national presentation along with Marissa Williams, uh, and so you partnered on a film there. Yes, and that's wonderful. Yes, with my and, <laughs> Yes, um, and so we'll be looking at Sinise's film a little bit later. But um, I have an esteemed historian here, a Mr. Lewis Carter, and he has. Uh, there are many creative ways that he has taught youth using history and he'll be talking about that a little bit more but but tell us I mean you've been doing this for a few years now you, you're a reenactor and then you also teach kids yes um, I started in 1989 when the movie glory came out mm -hmm. and uh, it was a gentleman named Brian Pohanka who's a historian who knew that there were a number of other black gentlemen going around to battlefields uh, in the area and they knew the history and he decided to talk to the movie makers. I have a bunch of guys can help you out with the extras. So he got us together at the U.S. Park Station over in Anacostia, and then we went down to South Carolina and did the movie. After the movie, we decided that we we're going to keep it going because uh, we felt people needed to know more about it, uh, more blacks needed to know their history. Myself, I was a uh, uh, Worked for DC Fire. I worked 34 years there. I was an EMS chief, and I worked on one of the most busiest uh, medic units in the city, in southeast and northeast. And we always picked up kids mm -hmm. that were, you know, shooting a lot of shootings, and just didn't make any sense. So I said, if I'm getting proud and I feel proud of what I'm learning, then I needed to share that. And I went to a couple of schools. One school in particular was T.C. Williams, and what the teacher did. She sent me. She had. To, the students write letters mm -hmm. and send them to me. And I had told them to go ask your grandparents and your mother and father about your family history and see what you come up with. And a lot of them came back with a lot of interesting stories and funny stories about how they, they laughed because their parents did the same things that the parents were yelling at them about. Mm -hmm. They did the same things. But I think that I had a bond grow there and they did find out some little few things about their history. Mm. And so, and do you bring the kids to your reenactments with your? your um, no, they have to come by um, the schools, the parents, and we talk to them when they when they show up to where we go. Most of the time, is, is the reenact. It's not really reenactments, but uh, like last week, we did something at Fort Ward, is living history, where we set up the camp and then we would talk how they live and talk about what they did. And if there's a battle in there, we'll, we'll tell them what to happen there. And I'll uh, just explain basically the little things that they would have, like a, a picture of his wife or how they brush their teeth with real baking soda. And not many people know that because we ask and sort of tell people's age, oh, I know my grandmother used that. So, mm -hmm. and they know what it is. And uh, we show the pants, the clothes, how they set up their tent, how they set up their camps and moved on to the next, and the food they ate, so. Uh -huh. Uh, and you've, you brought some slides tonight for yes. us to see for what, what you do. Right. Uh, let's see, we see here the 54th Massachusetts. Yes, that's one of uh, some of our members in, uh, at a mill in Virginia that we did reenact, which you can see the tents and stuff behind, and we just posed for that and go to the next one. Okay. Now, um, this is zoo wops. They were at a, a reenactment we were at. Um, I had used the slide to tell how blacks got into the Civil War, and one reason was because they were not they were losing a lot of uh, Union soldiers that were being killed, so they, they wanted to use blacks also to help out with the manpower problems. So that's how they, uh, blacks end up in the war, through the, through the Emancipation Proclamation. You can go to the next. Mm -hmm. And as they did, they drilled a lot, as we did. This is in South Carolina. Um, right off from the Fort uh, Sumner. And this is one of the forts there, and we drilled just like they drilled, but they drilled all day, 
you can go to the next. Mm. And when they drill, it's important the sergeants, such as myself there, help train them. And they trained day and night uh, till they had it right. Um, they were real proud about what they did and they made sure they were doing it exactly the way they should. Next, you can go to the next. Again, this just shows how we drilled. This was done at Fort Ward here in Virginia and Alexander. And it's a bayonet drill? Yeah, this is a bayonet drill. Mm -hmm. um, now, we also, when we tell our stories, we go uh, into like a first person. We talk about home, where we came from. Um, I'm playing a role of William Christian Fleetwood is a sergeant major. And um, some of these guys, they would talk about the ladies there, how they miss them, um, how being at the war, they would rather be home. Next. This is one we took up at uh, Oakley Cabin up in Maryland. And these are ladies, they were a, a choir group that sang at Oakley Cabin. So I actually asked them to set up the shot. Um, what she's saying, the colored soldiers are coming. So I had her point like we were coming. And mm. um, she did that well. Now, people have always said that US, uh, the, U, uh, the USCTs and the Union always ate salt pork and hard tack. Well, when they were in areas like, the, like around in this area where they had rivers, major roads, uh, trains, they ate well. When they marched into a plantation, the uh, slaves there were extremely happy and were celebrating. They would have huge feasts. So it's very seldom that the soldiers on the coast actually ate hard tack. The ones that went north up into West Virginia and Tennessee might have ate uh, hard tack, but the ones here around this area probably ate well. You can go to the next. Mm. And it's the same thing there. You can go to the next. And this one is just where information is being got from the slaves or the people in the area. They could have been free. And they just basically tell them the rebels and the, the master went that away. And mm -hmm. the soldiers are on the way to get them next. A lot of the information also was gotten from the women and just around the dinner table where they were eating from slaves. They would listen to the conversation, then go and give it to someone like the next, next lot. Mm. So intelligence officers, so mm -hmm. to speak. Or spies, even. Mm -hmm. You can go to the next. Okay. Thank Can't go. Oh, there we are. And they would give that information to people like Harriet Tubman. And that's the lady that's portraying Harriet Tubman over on the Eastern Shore. Mm. Go to the next. This is just basically a Confederate and Union cannon uh, duel. You can go to the next on that one. He's again where the Union troops, this is in Charleston, South Carolina, where Fort Wagner was um, actually at. It's sort of about 100 yards behind, and we're doing a dedication. Next. You can, this is just a uh, soldier. He's out, and he ran into some rebels from that other scene. You can go to the next. This is, again, uh, how they would fight in the fort. We were demonstrating to people how they would actually use the uh, bomb proofs and the walls to fight over the walls. You see a cannon there also. You can go to the next. Mm -hmm. We talk about the wounded, the ones that were killed. We have guys that pretend to be medics and actually treat the wounds. You can go to the next. Mm -hmm. These are rebels over, marching over me. Unfortunately, I was wounded and the, the rebels just marched on and kept attacking our group. So you can go to the next. Wow. Um, this picture was done down by Fort Wagner, and this was actually, this is the start of the Battle of Fort Wagner, and we actually fired at the exact time that the battle actually started, which was about uh, 6, 6.40 some uh, p.m. You can go to the next. Again, there's a wounded soldier being taken care of on the battlefield. You can go to the next. Again, another wounded soldier being treated. You can go to the next. Mm. Confederates, again, marching over me, so I was mm. unfortunately wounded that time. You go to the next. Uh, we were firing back, basically a mock battle. Um, we are firing back at them. You go to the next. Mm -hmm. uh, again, this is our steward. He's checking this uh, guy out to see what his injuries were, and they're protecting him while he's checking him out. You can go to the next. This one, unfortunately, is being prayed over, so she, he didn't quite make it. Actually, this is a lady that's portraying a soldier mm -hmm. in our reenactment group. You can go to the next. 
-hmm. Again, they pointing out rebels that may be coming and about to fire. You can go to the next. Cannon fire, you can go to the next. As the Confederates, again, um, marching over the wounded soldiers. So this was at the Battle of Spotsylvania. You can go to the next. This is Anderson Prison. We actually went to Anderson Prison in Georgia. And uh, there, a lot of troops is the worst conditions, one of the worst prisons in the, during the Civil War period. A lot of disease and a lot of other things went on there where people were killed. There were gangs. They were stealing food from the uh, guys' clothes from them. And a lot of, uh, of the wounded guys died there. You can go to the next. That's the prison again. You can go to the next. That's where they live. There's some wounded. You can go to the next. And that's continue. And that's, that's our group again, and that's pretty much the end. But that gives you an idea of what we do. And we like I said, we go all over the East Coast to, to uh, do these reenactments or living histories and talk about the things they did. Um, the books I have helps us do what we call a first person. We read the books and we do those reenactments that you just saw uh, those pictures of, and then that gives us a pretty good idea of how they felt and what they did. So we're able to talk a lot better about what, what happened and what they did, um, how they lived, how they felt about it, because these books are from actually some of the members of the, uh, the unit. This is the fourth USCT out of Baltimore. They're also a unit that won, uh, was in the Battle of Newmarket Heights, where 14 medals of honor were won. This group particularly uh, had four medals, and one was uh, won by Christian Fleetwood, who I portray when I do these reenactments. Uh, and who is Christian Fleetwood? He is a sergeant major in the 4th uh, United States Colored Troops. Um, what happened, the flag was a center of, a, of attention. Wherever the flag was, you were supposed to line up on. When they attacked uh, the fort at Newmarket Heights, the flag bearer was wounded. Usually, the Confederates all aim to the flag bearer, bearer because if they get him, they figure they just disrupted the attack from the other troops. So uh, after this flag bearer went down, he handed it off to another guy. He was wounded. Then Christian Fleetwood came up and held the flag up and Good. rallied the troops to where he was at. Good. Well, we're, we're going to hear a little bit more about that in the next segment. And Sinees, you're going to have some questions for him when we come back, right? Yes. Good. Good. So. Uh, we'll, we'll be looking forward to that, and there's some other books that we'll be discussing there as we come back. So, yes. I need a job. Necesito trabajo. I would like to speak English better. Me gustaría hablar inglés mejor. I want to be a U.S. citizen. Quisiera ser ciudadano de los Estados Unidos. For over 35 years. Por más de 35 años. The Hispanic Committee of Virginia has been serving our community. El Comité Hispano de Virginia ha estado sirviendo a nuestra comunidad. Job training and placement. Capacitación. Ayuda para conseguir trabajo. Education for children and adults. Educación para niños y adultos. Immigration, naturalization, and medical referrals. Ayuda para los procesos de inmigración y naturalización y orientación sobre médicos are a small part of what we do. son solo una pequeña parte de lo que hacemos. For help, information, or to volunteer, para ayuda, información o para ofrecerse como voluntario, contact the Hispanic Committee of Virginia. comuníquese con el Comité Hispano de Virginia, helping everyone participate more fully in American society. ayudando a todos a participar plenamente en la sociedad norteamericana. Did you notice if you were missing half your kidney function? According to the National Kidney Foundation, 20 million people have chronic kidney disease and 20 million more may be at risk and not even know it. Anyone with high blood pressure, diabetes, or family history of chronic kidney disease is at risk. Early diagnosis is vitally important. To get the whole story, talk to your doctor and visit the National Kidney Foundation at kidney.org or call for a free brochure. Because when it comes to chronic kidney disease, you might not know the half.
We're back to the Inside Scoop. Here again, your host. Welcome back to Inside Scoop. We're here with Lewis Carter of the 54th Regiment at Massachusetts. I say 54th Massachusetts. And Sine Snowball. And, and, and she's a junior historian and filmmaker with the American History Film Project. So um, Sine had a few questions for uh, Mr. Carter about his, his history program. So. Right. Um, how were the soldiers treated? I know that they, back in the time, they didn't really have like the proper medicine that we use today, but how were they like treated? And how did they take care of those soldier, wounded soldiers? Um, they, they were treated fair and unfair, and a lot of, it depends on where they were and who they were with. As they went down south, a lot of disrespect from the citizens in that area. But as I said before, with the slaves, they were grateful, cheerful, and they treated them well. They fed them well. But there were other places that they weren't fed well. Sometimes their own officers would treat them a little bit harsher than they actually had to. They would make them do things they didn't have to do, like go dig trenches that they weren't really going to need, or even cut, cut trees down and then not use them. But other officers treated them well because they knew that they fought well. Uh, like at the 54th is one of those uh, better units that the officers treated them well. In the movie itself, Glory, they had to try to portray all, all, all the uh, USCT units. So that scene where Denzel got whipped in the 54th wouldn't have happened. Mm -hmm. So. Okay. And when the soldiers were killed, were, how were the fam were the family members notified, or what did they do with their bodies? Did they leave them there? Did they? <sighs> they were actually buried on the spot of the battleground, and they may have, their family may have been notified. The only other way that they would know if something was wrong with the guy didn't come back. There are still a lot of unknown soldiers that were on the battlefields mm -hmm. because of the wounds they received, or just because they'd been out there so long. There was no way to tell who they were or there was nobody else around, that whole unit might have been decimated, so there's nobody else around to say who they were. So you have a lot of unknown soldiers that were just pretty much buried on the spot. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, what were, I know that it wasn't always like <coughs> sunny, and I know that they had to go through some pretty rough weather. So what were some things that they could use to did they have any, like, that much blankets to cover up? Did some of them die from, you know, bad weather? Yeah, things? from uh, exposure to cold weather. But they um, wore wool. They didn't have silk or any of that. Yeah. Their, unif their clothes, civilian clothes, were wool coats, wool pants. So they were sort of warm on that. They were a lot stronger and hardier than we are today because, you know, they didn't go to McDonald's <laughs> and all those funny things. Right. So they were a lot stronger group of people, and they could they could deal with it better than we could. Mm -hmm. right. So, um, but like I said, today we have the actual uniforms that they had, and they are wool uniforms. And on a day like today, you have to know where you are and stop when you start feeling because you can heat exhaustion or heat stroke from it. Let's see. What was what's the most interesting question you've had from a student when when you're doing this when you're presenting this? <laughs> most interest. Actually, <laughs> it wasn't towards me, but it was towards another guy. And the student asked him, "Was he really in the Civil War?" <laughs> so, <laughs> but that was, he was he was an older guy. He's actually passed away now. But he was mm -hmm. he was probably 80, 80, 80 something, eighty one. And he had a big gray beard, and he he loved the history, and he loved going out talking. So he would come out, and because he he actually looked like he was actual real <laughs> veteran, so he would get that type of answer, and we would sort of you know smirk and laugh behind him or, or to the side when he got asked that question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, and I remember reading about a, a Civil War film how they had to get folks from Romania as actors because the Americans are just too well fed <laughs> to yeah. look like Civil War soldiers. <laughs> but um, but no, it's amazing. And then you were saying that sometimes in these reenactments the weather's bad, and then you're saying that you can you can only uh, empathize with what the guys mm -hmm. went through because you only yeah. yeah. Once you you read about it in one of these books, and you then you go out and reenact. And you're actually there, and you and at sometimes you feel like you're actually gone back in time, because a lot of places are in isolated wooded areas, so you don't have planes or lights, city lights or sirens, so it's quiet. Everything is pretty much in in period perspective, 
Civil War period, you had horses and wagons in some cases. So you can actually sort of drift back and say you're back there and um, be, be what we call first person. Mm -hmm. Wow, amazing. Now, um, Sinise worked on a film looking at the history of, of her church, and she, the idea was um, Marisa Williams' idea. And you guys yes. are, you're actually her niece, but you're related. Yes. <laughs> so even though you're older, you're Annandale High School senior. Yes. But, um, but I think what's wonderful about that project is the kids bring up their ideas and they can enlist their whole family, church, family, you know, and they can have their teachers help out. But it's really the, the kids come up with the idea. So would you be interested in doing something on uh, his regiment sometime? Oh, of some course, research? of course. It's yeah. very, it, it's, it's some good information. I mean, even in high school, mm -hmm. uh, we learn certain, just little parts though, mm -hmm. but not as widespread as the books can get to. Yeah, so. so to watch you in action would be something fun to film. Yeah. And, and something, <laughs> you know, and just, just that's, that's make it- That's been done too, so. Make it come alive, yeah. So, but we're going to show a little bit of Sinise's film and get your reaction to it. Okay. And we're ready to roll whenever they are. And there we go. And this is the history of Mount Pleasant Baptist Church. And that's Marisa. Yes. Some history of my church, Mount Pleasant Baptist Church. I am a member here at Mount Pleasant Baptist Church where Reverend Dr. Carl Johnson is a pastor. Mount Pleasant Baptist Church was founded by free slaves who traveled to Alexander seeking a new way of life. The good character of these free men impressed, impressed a wealthy landowner named Charles H. Brown. He sold them 60 acres of land on which to build their home. Then he and his wife donated one acre of land to build a church and the land was deeded on September 7th 1867 after the Civil War had ended. Their church intentionally consisted a single pine log building. Their church is now 148 years old. How long have you been a member of Mount Pleasant Baptist Church? I've been a member of Mount Pleasant Baptist Church for 60 years. I understand your parents and even your grandparents were members of this church. How far back does your family go back here? Uh, my grandparents actually were members here in the 1900s. This is at the turn of the century. And uh, they, they were very active. My grandfather was a trustee here at Mount Pleasant Baptist Church as well as I have several cousins who were deacons and another cousin who was a trustee, so we had our family involved in Mount Cliff. Is, is this about the cemetery? Yes, Marissa, this is actually a plot that goes back to 1909 that shows the layout of the cemetery. Basically, it shows there were 32 original families that had plots within what we call the Independent Association. And okay, and that's just, that's just a little tidbit from the film. Um, and your church is celebrating their 150th anniversary. Yes. And when will that be about? Um, sometime in September. It's closest down to the end of the year. Mm, yes. Amazing. Okay, good. And the part we didn't get to see there, though, is there's a long history. They actually, what happened is the folks, um, the enslaved people moved from Old Town, Alexandria, and they yes. moved out to the Lincolnia area near Annandale. And they, they bought land or they were you know given land grants um, when they were set free. And so what was wonderful is that there was, the, the church was part of literacy, you had a school there. Yes. Uh, it help, helped people transition. And so it was, a, it was a great history 150 years ago, in addition to has a, a, a very significant history in the civil rights movement in the 1960s. Yes. So tell me a little bit more about that, uh, the, the, that history. Um, I mean, it goes way back. Um, mm -hmm. It just 
it, it's fascinating on how they the steps that they went through to you know get everything together to build that church um it's it was a. It wasn't an easy. It wasn't easy for them, mm -hmm. but they managed to get through it and um, speak to people. I mean, they were always prayer was the number one thing, and um, that mm -hmm. that is what helped them get that far to have that church. And mm -hmm. it, it just goes far. Right? So very grounded <laughs> right down in the prayer. line. Yes. Okay. Wow. And courage. A lot of courage. Yes. I hear some of the stories. So yes. Yeah. A lot of courage. And so and so you when you stood up at the American History Film Project exhibition at the city of Fairfax Blenheim House, yes. you said doing this project changed you. So how, how did that it was a very hand. It was a hands-on experience for me, mm -hmm. um, just doing it with my aunt, who came up with the idea of uh, making this film about a church cemetery. Um, I've learned tremendous amount of information from Bill Gordon. Um, he's one of the trustees at our church. Um, he gave me a lot of information on the church, um, especially family connections in there and everything. But it changed me because it made me want to make a film myself by just experiencing it with my aunt, how much she learned from it, how much we both learned from it. It wasn't mm -hmm. something that um, you can type up on the internet. We have to do our research and go through the books, have interviews with people and stuff like that. Wow. Oh, so, and so which books did you go through? The books that we went through was, the first book we went through was actually our um, Mount Pleasant Baptist Church directory. And it goes from like who was the first pastor and you know how when they passed away who was the next and things like that and how what year it was um built and the transition of the church because i believe that the church has been through at least three different changes ever since because the big the new church now is actually still connected with the old one um, that stood longer than the other, the new one has. Mm. And there's a lot of, it's been a lot of transitions in the church as well. For the building, wow. And so we're going to have Marisa come on with you in the next yes. segment. And you'll be, <laughs> talk, be able to talk a little bit more, but I, th I know that you worked on the research together and there's so much to it. Yes. Um, Mr. Carter, do you have any input you'd yeah, like was, to give? Uh, uh, about I want to ask you, how, how hard was it to, for you to find information on the church that you run into blocks or walls to get the information on it? Actually, no, because of the connections that we have in the church and the information that they have always kept and never really lost. Yeah. Yep. What I might do is it, I might have, would you like to have him on in the next segment, ask some more questions? Yes. Okay, so we'll have Mr. Carter back, and then we'll have Maurice in the fourth. I helped turn my child's public school into a whole new kind of school. One with the curriculum that really motivates kids. One that has extended hours, six days a week, year round. With loads of academic, cultural, and recreational activities. One that has support services, like medical and dental, right there. A school where parents' involvement is encouraged. Where teachers have more time to teach and students are excited about learning. There's just one problem. My child doesn't ever want to come home. You can help turn your school into a community school for excellence. Find out how. Call 1-877-LOVE-TO-LEARN. It's coming right to your neighborhood. And when it does, you may be surprised. It's your Social Security Statement of Your Benefits, and it's going to help you plan your financial future. Your benefit statement will tell you how much Social Security you're eligible to receive and when you'll get it. Then you'll know how much you need to save for retirement, because that's coming too. The future is in your hands. Choose to save. The toxic fumes from this meth lab are seeping into Jamie's sinus cavity. Ammonia vapors invade her throat. Toxic gases fill her lungs. Jamie's body is deteriorating. And she doesn't even know it. Jamie, dinner. So, 
who has a drug problem now. Find out how meth affects you at drugfree.org. We're back to the Inside Scoop. Here again, your host. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. And again, we're with Sine Snowball and Mr. Carter from the 54th Regiment. And we, we again, you had some questions for Sine about her film. And yeah. uh -huh. oh, did you, when you uh, went through the records, did you find that any of the Civil War soldiers came back to live there or had families in there? Um, actually, we, well, I do know that we did have some soldiers that were buried in that cemetery. Um, it was about, about ten, five of them that was buried there. And, um, so we do know, we do know that some probably did come back and lived on that land and, and were with their family, yes. Yeah, because, uh, Camp Casey was a camp that they trained at, it basically was where the Pentagon's at now. And a lot of those soldiers, there was also a contraband camp near Camp Casey. And my understanding is what happened after the war, a lot of them had wives of that uh, contraband. They went to little small parts of the city in different mm -hmm. areas and lived. So I was wondering, that's why I asked you that question, if they, they had anybody actually living there. Wow, that's it's neat how yeah. it's all in yeah, <laughs> it's all you know, <laughs> and he gets around, so that's wonderful. So and it, and then we were talking earlier too about uh, up in Massachusetts, you've mm -hmm. got in Boston Commons, mm -hmm. there's a great memorial to mm -hmm. your regiment. It, describe yeah, what that's it like. It was, uh, I guess, my f second year. We went up. They paid for everything. They got us up there. Um, we went up there, and uh, what we're going to do is what we did was rededicate the statue to Shaw and the 54th, which is in Boston Commons. And they put us up in the uh, Coast Guard barracks. Uh, we went to the Afro American Baptist Church and had a ceremony there. Then we marched out to the Boston Commons, did a ceremony there. And then we formed up in the park there and marched through Boston, just like they did when they left Boston to go fight down south. So that was. That was really a, a moving type of situation because we've had probably close to 100 USCTs that had, uh, we had new groups that started. My unit was the first, well, it was another one, the seventh USCT in Baltimore, they faded out. So we were the only one left and then people started hearing about us and knowing and they said, well, we want to start one here. So they started calling us. We went as far as Boston, far north as Ohio, far south as Oklahoma and actually started other USCT units. So mm -hmm. we have quite a few over the, all over the country. We have one in California, and I can't quite understand why the fourth USCT is in California. But then somebody left here and went to California and started the fourth USCT. Okay, and then, and then they're doing the reenactments too. That's the way Probably more living history. Yeah. And, and you know, just in California. I'm, I, I would like to go out and meet them, see what they're doing, but most likely it's living history. What are the changes you've seen in youth when they're exposed to living history? Um, pride shoots up. A couple of teachers have told me that the student really seemed to, they changed a little. They had uh, a few students that looked like they were going that wrong path. And uh, one teacher told me he straightened up and started going on a more positive path instead of that wrong path. Have. Um, the ones that talked to their parents, there was a tighter bond with the parents, and uh, I guess I didn't, I'm not sure how, but I'm sure that they were going on the right path instead of that wrong path. Because, like I said, with DC Fire, I saw two 12 year olds that were shot, mm. you know, and one was on a Sunday morning, and I, he, they shot him six times right in the middle of his chest. And what the police told me was the drug dealers trying to make examples of him. Mm. And I said, This boy. This time in the morning should be at home in bed getting ready to go to church and not being out here like that. So that just made me say, well, I got to do more than get them at this point. If I can help some of them, I can. So I started, I said, if I can get one out of 10, then I've done something. But I just couldn't sit there and, and let it happen. I had to do something. I had two boys of my own. And it scared me because everybody wore the same clothes. And when I was in the street, I heard, oh, it's, the police would say, it's drug laid. I said, well, you don't know that just because he's wearing uh, Timberlands or Nikes or whatever the coats were at the time doesn't mean he's a drug dealer. So, because I looked at my son, I said, "Well, they could look like this. They're wearing the same thing. They look the same." So, mm. I just hope that uh, you know I reach a few of them to help them 
uh, make a positive decision. And, and uh, like with my sons, they, were, they kept going on the right path. So I didn't have any problem with them keeping their pants up. So they, they don't wear the pants around me. So. Yeah, the belt roll. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So. I think that it also gives us an understanding of, you know, our history mm -hmm. and how we should um, always, you know, show respect because, you know, a lot of people fought for our lives, for everyone's lives, to get to this point, to mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the same, or be on the same page and on the same there right was, path. There was a, a soldier, his name was Morgan W. Carter out of the 28th USCT, and he fought down at the Battle of the Crater. And then after the Battle of the Crater, he went to City Point for rest and recuperation just to uh, refresh, more or less. So he got some letters, and a friend from uh, Indiana wrote him and asked him, said, why did you leave your house, your farm, your wife, your kids, and you go out fighting this battle that you're most certainly going to die? Because at that time, the Confederates had said any Union, especially black or white officers court, they could be dealt with immediately. They were uh, insurrectionists, so they could be killed right mm -hmm. off. So he'd ask them why. So in his letter, he wrote that most of them felt the same way, that they were there to raise their uh, people to a higher standard in life. And he, he, he got to say that and if he didn't receive the benefit of what they did that day, if, if he should die, he would die most willingly because he had a consolation of knowing that future generations are going to receive the benefit of what they did that day. Mm -hmm. So then when I tell him that, I look at the kids and say, are you doing what he says? Are you benefiting from going to school? Are you doing the best you can? If not, you need to do the best you can, then check with your parents because some of these guys could be your great-great-grandfathers. So these are your people, and they died so that you could sit here and read a book where they couldn't read a book. So that's a, a privilege that you have that you should use. Mm, wow, that's amazing. So, yes. yeah. yeah. And especially come all the way from Indiana, like say he could he could stay on his farm and let, let them yeah, right, you know, let them right. fight in Virginia he, if they want to fight in Virginia. He decided to fight, and that was a that was a horrific battle too to say that you would be willing to do it all over again. I was like, wow, this. Yeah. Mm. And most of them felt that way. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. And there's and the, again, when if if everyone gets up to Boston Commons, that particular um, sculpture. I, I hear that the sun, when the sun shifts, you get a different, mm -hmm. it shows on different faces yeah, it's, it's, throughout uh, the sun. And it's sort of, quite it's, dramatic. It's, it's, uh, I, I don't think it's gold. I think it's a, a brass, like, but it looks like gold, so it shines. Um, when we, when we did, did the rededication, there were liquor bottles, vines, and, and uh, trees, cleaned and bushes growing all mm -hmm. over it, so they cleaned it up. And then we were dedicated, and it was totally different from what we had saw when we first got there. Wow. Yeah. No, well, a lot of people appreciate it now, and they yeah. appreciate your work. So so thank you for that, and also thank you for your service with the EMS. That's a whole other story we can yeah. have you on about yeah, emergency <laughs> services. So that's great. And then, and so, so September, everyone needs to come visit your church yes. and they can see the whole film in, 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 in total and they can, yes. they can see the film and it'll be part of the history celebration yes. there. Yeah. And, uh, and Marisa will be on with you and talk a little bit more about that process because it was, it was definitely a, a group effort and she, yes. she, uh, she got, she got everyone together. She has a way of rallying people together. Yeah. So yes, she does. <laughs> it changed both of them. So that's, it's, a, it's amazing work. And it's amazing to see what you guys did. I saw the first draft, and the audience here saw some of the first draft. And the second one was so much improved. And, and the music, and, and who chose the music on, on that one? Do you remember? Um, actually, a lady named Miss Kendria Perry. Uh -huh. She's actually my dance instructor at work. I mean, not at work, sorry. Um, at church, because I do liturgical dance. And she knows a little bit about um, putting videos together and stuff like that and the music. It was actually one of the songs that we actually like practice to and stuff like that at the church as well. So she has a lot of different variety of music that she gets everything from. Oh, yeah, that's that's good. It's very very artistic, very yes. appro very appropriate, and it was upbeat and it kept you, you know, into yes. the films. So that's that's great. Now, is there anything you any more questions you have for Mr. Carter on his his project? I, um, if 
we, since we're local, we help out. We go to different places, mm -hmm. and we we find old graves. A lot of times, the soldiers are buried, and then we would go there and help them clean it up and do rededications. Mm. So at your church, it, that's possible. We, you know, if you find some, we might be able to come out with a couple of guys and do some type of rededication to their grave, their tombstones. Okay. Because um, there's quite a few of them around. Adams Morgan has about 30 graves there, and they're all pretty, they weren't disinterred, so they built the park and part of the zoo over top of them. And they said there's something like a couple thousand people buried in that little area right up at Adams Morgan. Wow. Mm -hmm. So we, we worked with them, and we did a little dedication for that, but they got students from Howard trying to find out where all the graves are. Mm -hmm. And there's someone who was buried in Liberty Cemetery, which is in Pine Ridge Park, but I'm not sure if you've been there. But it's the other, the other side of Annandale. It's just a little bit over mm -hmm. from you toward the Gallus Road part instead of the Columbia Pike part. But, but yeah, there's, I know you've got some history in your, in your oh, yes. and, then there's, and then there's also Liberty. So we'd love to see you back, mm -hmm. and maybe we could film you to the dedication. So <laughs> sure. that, would, that would be very good. Yeah. So, yeah. And, uh, and tell us a little bit about these books that you're talking Well, those about. were, a lot of these were written by some of the actual soldiers and the officers that were actually there. So you're getting a f another firsthand mm -hmm. account of what they went through. And that just, like I said, with, for us reenactors, it just gives you that first person. Once you read these books, then you go out and camp out like they did or fight a battle. I mean, there's been battles uh, like the Battle of Nashville. I, I broke through the lines and got trapped on the other side, and they said, the rebels told me, we're gonna, you were captured. And I said, not today. And they said, you see one black guy and a bunch of rebels behind the line chasing me. But when I got at that other end and I looked down, I'm like, wow, it looked real because there was so much going on and they would clash together and the smoke and all, it just looked real. And unfortunately, the camera I had ran out of film, so I couldn't take a picture of it. Mm -hmm. But, um, well, so we've got, so in September, we've got the, your, your, your anniversary, 105th anniversary, we've got the opening of the African American Museum at the Smithsonian. Mm -hmm. So that's something. And then what else is going on coming at the, for summer and fall? Well, we had another event. So it's, it's on our website. We got a few uh, living history things. We got a, actually, uh, I think it's Chestertown, Maryland. They found, we found two graves over there last year. I think they're going to do some type of dedication this year. They have a June tea festival, and we go over there. A lot of the uh, USCTs after the war lived in Chestertown, and they built a, a veteran's house there. Good. And they restored the house. They, Completely, we did and restored us. So I want to invite everyone to Chestertown yeah. and come back for a prep. Well, well, we'll see you. Thank you for coming. Okay. And then we're gonna we're gonna be back with Marisa. So you stay put. Marisa Williams will come on and and again we just thank you so much for visiting us. Okay. Some dreams are universal. Dreams that inspire us. Multiple sclerosis is a devastating disease that changes lives forever. The National MS Society does more for people with MS than any organization in the world. But we can't do it alone. To get involved, visit us online at nationalmssociety.org or call 1-800-FIGHT-MS. This is why we're here. Because nobody dreams of having multiple sclerosis. What's wrong with this picture? Half of young Americans can't locate economic powers like Japan and India. 20% can't even find the Pacific Ocean. Without geography, our children aren't ready for the world. Geography is everywhere. It's incredible creatures. Rhythm, fashion, flavor. It's economics and politics. It's change. Understanding connections between people and places is critical in the 21st century. 
That's why we created MyWonderfulWorld.org. Go there now for your free parent and teacher action kits and give our kids the power of global knowledge. Because kids who understand our world today can succeed in it tomorrow. We're back to the Inside Scoop. Here again, your host. And welcome back. And we're here with Marisa Williams and Sinise Noble again. And uh, Marisa worked on the film for the American History Film Project, and she's back. And so the film that we showed is a new, improved film. It's the one that she just shown at the recent exhibition. And it'll be shown again on the 150th anniversary of your church. And, uh, and there's a lot going on this September. We've got that. We've got the opening of the, the African American Museum at the Smithsonian. And there's just so many good things. So, so she's, she's, gonna, she's just making the social rounds with yeah. her film. And we're just we're proud of your work. And we had a picture of uh, Mr. Carter from the last segment. We want to show that briefly again. This is Mr. Carter from the 54th Regiment. And uh, his picture was, well, what did you think of his talk? I think it was very cool. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I just thought it was cool. OK, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it, was, it was very cool. Um, and, and so that's the kind of thing that we're thinking about. Maybe one of the guys, and that's him doing his, his reenacting. So what, what do you think about that? What would you think about actually watching him act out his, his uh, war things? So I was just like, yeah, the bravery, the bravery. Yeah. It all came, but anyway. Um, and so when you were digging into the books that Sinees was talking about, did, did anything surprise you about your church's history? Um, I don't know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think I think you're a little shy. You're talking about it, but it was a lot of work, a lot of work, and it's so neat. And how did you go about you? You heard about the project, and then you you started recruiting your family. So how did you approach Sinise to help you? Well, um, um, I. Well, I told my mom first, and then my mom told my niece, and so then she um, she said yes to it, and I was glad because I needed help on it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's good. I, I work good with, a little bit with technology as well, especially working with iPads and, of course, the new iPhone and stuff like that, working with the technology and knowing how to, like, do proper lighting a little bit and get the film of everything that she was saying. and and things like that. Mm -hmm. And the editing was good, and then I noticed also, um, and, and, and you're beautiful no matter what you wear, but <laughs> you, you, it was neat to see you transition from, from a cool jacket and a casual look, and then, and then the next film you had like the pearls or whatever, you're just, <laughs> yeah. you know, all, all formal. So who, who was your costume designer in the second one? <laughs> um, me. Oh, really? So it's yes. just a different look. So you like the different looks? Yeah. Good. Yes. Good. So yeah, that's, it's a lot of fun. It's, it's a lot of fun. And, it's, and we, had, we had some fun similarly to, with that. Sometimes I go tromping through in the field and different people will shoot me and, and I'll either have on just ponytail and glasses or whatever. So I like <laughs> getting formal or getting casual. And, so I'm, I, I, anyway, it's so much fun to see you guys grow as filmmakers and historians and and all that. So uh, now, of the films, uh, now you also recruited your cousin. So um, that's what's a lot of fun. So this uh, film fest that we had at the city of Fairfax had Arizona, it had Nebraska, and it had two from California. But one of the Californians was your cousin. So how did you go about asking her to join? Um, up? My, I think when Miss Barnes she asked. She asked my mom, and I think my mom asked my cousin, so I think that's how she knew about it. Ah, so it's very good. So we're going to show a, a short film clip from, from the, the California film, and uh, I know that we'll see your whole film. Uh, they, have to, they have to come to your 150th anniversary mm -hmm. to see your whole film. But uh, when it's ready, they could show the California film. And, uh, and then we're also going to see a couple other films and get your opinion on them. But this was this is the beginning of your cousins. 
My name is Jenna Sellers, and I've had a very long history here with the Herod Public Library. I've been coming here to this library as a patron since I was probably about two or three years old. And I remember just coming here to this library really is something that helped me love reading. As a young kid, seeing all the books, all the vast amounts of books here, and seeing how the librarians were so enthusiastic and so excited to share with us these books and give us book recommendations and read to us and things like that, it really got me excited about reading. And now that this library is about to be torn down and they're going to be making a new one, I thought it would be really important to showcase the history of this library and all that it's meant for me personally over the years and all that it means to other various young people and to the librarians who have been here for years over the time. So I really wanted this project to reflect the rich history that this library has. The current library building right now was built in like the 1950s, um, really hasn't had much renovation. Um, you really can't see it on the surface, but there's stuff falling apart everywhere. We are all very excited about it, uh, most of us are, but I have to say um, there's a lot of staff and patrons that aren't so excited about it. And I think it's because of the fact that they have a nostalgic connection with this library. Some of these people view this library as their childhood library, and they can't dare see us tearing this building down. I have a lot of mixed emotions about the library being built. Um, I would say overall it's positive emotions, but it is a little sad to, to have to see this um, building with so many memories in it um, get torn down. I hope that this library, that the new library, that even though hopefully it's going to be bigger, that it doesn't lose the sense of like community and closeness that this like smaller building has. Okay, so that was a little bit of the Hayward film. And yes. so what was it like to be at the film project and see all the different kids from different states and then and also see your cousin? Um, I think it was cool to experience all of the other videos that other people made and um, what they learned about it too. Mm -hmm. Were you surprised about anything you learned about other states? Um, yeah. 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 Good, good. Now we have a picture of the kids that did something from Nebraska. I don't know if that'll pop up, but it was just a still photo of the kids. But what did you think of the um, sod houses video? That they had houses it, made of sod. In it was definitely Nebraska. something new. I did not really, I heard of sod, but I didn't really actually like know that they could even use that to build like a house out of it. I thought that was very, very interesting. Of course, it's just like learning is like the number one thing. Yeah in life like you oh, just yeah. learn so much every single day about everything yeah and it's like it's it's adobe it's kind of like adobe where it hardens up and all that but the yes. fa fact is that the settlers did that and here we're so spoiled we have to have our right. brick and our insulation right. and our you know yeah, they just use air what conditioning. they could <laughs> yeah. Yeah. they use what they could to you know just live you know mm -hmm. now we just have you know things that we can just <laughs> buy and then mm -hmm. put together. And as Lewis Carter said, that they were so resilient because of living that way and, right. and all that. So, and then the Arizona film, we have a piece from the Arizona film uh, whenever, whenever you bring it up, but it was, what did you think of the Arizona films? I think it was cool because like, it had like, it had a background of Arizona and, and it was cool. Yeah, it was, it was called Jacob's Waltz, and then there was another one that was called Hohokam, which was the Indians. The oh, Indians yeah, I like that yes. part, too. Oh, you they like had Hohokam? the Indians in it. Okay. And, and, yeah, I think we might show a little bit about that. And then, yeah. This is Jacob. Today I'm going to be telling you a legend about Jacob Waltz. He was a very mysterious man, although there is a little documented evidence about the gold mine. We know there is gold and now there are superstitions. He was born in Germany around 1810. He and his dad emigrated to America in 1840 and became naturalized citizens in 1861. His dad brought him to America to escape political discord and revolution. They arrived in America, Waltz tried to work as a tailor, and a tailor that thought he was never going to get rich by doing these jobs. 
once had heard rumors about the gold mines in the West. He is most famous for his lost judgment gold mine. It is known that he found it, as he's been seen with gold on many occasions when he bought his supplies. When he wasn't looking for gold, he spent his time in Phoenix living in a home near Julia Thomas and friend Ryan Harper Trash. superstitions. Uh, now, where are them gold pans? I had them a minute ago. Where are them gold pans, Bessie? Now, we can't forget our water. It's 115 degrees out there. Uh, That's right, Bessie. Now, let's go up Siphon Draw and see if we can get the Weaver's Needle from there. We've got to find that humongous world. I think it was leaning to the right a bit, with one arm up and one arm down, and the other arm pointing to the goal. Now let's get going, Bessie. Uh, Wait, I better look around to see if anybody's following me. Remember that story I told Dan on Washington Street? I told them everything except to find a clue. Remember one of the clues I told them, Betsy? Uh, I think it went like this. From the tunnel of my mind, you can see thy military trail below. From thy military trail, you can see the entrance of my mind. Now, I trip. Okay, so they had some interesting sound effects in that <laughs> yes. video, didn't they? Yeah. Now, there's there's more to it than that, and you'll be able to see that on the YouTube channel, and, and maybe on the 4th of July, we'll play more of the films in their entirety. But, um, but yeah, so, and you were saying you love the scenery in Arizona. Yeah, yes. I like the background of it because it kind of seemed fake, but it was actually really real. Yeah. So I thought that was cool. Yeah, that's how it really looks, just almost a few blocks from their school. Yeah. But yes. uh, yeah, it's a very different, it's, it's the Chaparral area. <laughs> and so very different environment than we have here. Oh, of course, uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Does it make you want to travel out to Arizona? Yeah. Yes, yeah. it does. Uh, yeah. Probably not in the summertime though, because I know in Arizona it gets pretty hot. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it gets hot here, but I don't think it's as hot there. Yeah, 102 in the shade. I have cousins in Phoenix. I know. Yeah. Wow. So, but it's it's yeah. But they but they they you know everyone adapts and they love it and yeah, it's, right it's good. right. But yeah, and everyone wants to be there in the winter. So what did you think about the Indiana film? I think in that was seconds. very <laughs> hilarious and cute. I really did. Yeah. That was very interesting. And then they're young as well. That yeah. was very cool. Yeah, the Indiana film is definitely you're, you know, it gets it's very addicting to hear. So we'll we'll go over this some more and thanks for coming back. And we we hope to show the film later in July. Yes. In its entirety. Thank you.